thank you very much for, for coming to join uh, us this lunchtime, uh, where Mark uh, Malik Brown, the chairman of Crisis Group, will speak to some of the issues that our organization uh, is looking at uh, in 2016. This is, I think, the, the sixth year that Crisis Group has put out one of these lists. Um, and they're, they're useful intellectual exercises to, to help us think through some of the, the, the transversal issues that, that, that we confront in, in our work across the globe. And, and Mark will uh, speak to some of these uh, in addition to any country-specific issues that are raised during the course of, of, of our conversation. So Mark is going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then we'll open it up for a, for a broader conversation. So I will hand over to Mark. Well, well thank you. And you know, if I could just add, actually, a warm welcome to Richard Moncrief, who used to brief me at the Foreign Office on Africa, and I thought he was much too good wasted on the Foreign Office. So thrilled that he, he's joined us at the crisis group now. Um, the 10 crises that we've, we've sort of highlighted this year, just, you know, some of you will have seen the paper, uh, the foreign policy article, but just to sort of just mention them. I'm going to come back to a number of them at greater length as I talk, but Syria and Iraq, uh, Turkey and the PKK, Yemen, Libya, Boko Haram and the Lake Chad Basin, South Sudan, Burundi, Afghanistan, the South China Sea, and Colombia. And, you know, they're a little bit different. I mean, a lot, I've struck how many organizations now begin their Januaries with, with lists of uh, the 10 hotspots. I was at a very good briefing uh, last week by uh, the Eurasia group and you know they their, their, their crises were things like technology, closed Europe, Saudi Arabia, um, unpredictable authoritarian leaders the likes of Putin and Erdogan and such like and still other lists uh, in ruin our January with Things like superbugs are going to sweep their way past every antibiotic defense out there. And, and so you kind of, if you look at all these lists, it's, it's, it's not surprising. Uh, you, you wonder why most years uh, the markets don't start with the kind of financial blues that they have this year. Um, if all those traders read these reports, they'd be terribly gloomy. But ours, in a sense, are deliberately not crises that necessarily move markets. For us, as the crisis group, the thing that matters most is crises where huge and unnecessary loss of, take, uh, loss of life is taking place and humanitarian uh, distress occurring. And above all, crises which we think the world has, in most cases, forgotten about or chosen to overlook. Uh, the speciality of the crisis group, the reason we came into being 20 years ago, was the hidden crises that people want to brush under the carpet. And what we really love is a crisis which started that way and where tough, effective diplomacy finally turns the corner. Uh, and, you know, Bosnia was an example of that, where we began agitating for action, and finally there was, and uh, the results stemmed the terrible loss of life which was taking place. And on this year's list, Colombia uh, is similarly a cause for some cautious celebration, because after a war, a civil war that had run riot for years, you know, very brave diplomacy. Uh, is finally getting that one to, 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 to the finishing line. So, you know, we, we in that way are an organization which tries to put the spotlight uh, in places that it's convenient for others not to look, and therefore probably a word about our beginnings in Bosnia. You know, I myself at the time was working as a political consultant a couple of friends called me and said, you know, we've got to do something about Bosnia, this slaughter of Muslims in the middle of Europe with uh, nobody reacting from uh, the side of, um, of, of, of the Western governments on anything like sufficient scale. is just a terrible humanitarian tragedy. And I, myself, as a young man working for the UN, had lived through Cambodia and some other things where I'd saw the price of inaction. So, 
a group of us put together a kind of citizens group initially to try and uh, lobby capitals from Washington to Europe to act in the case of Bosnia. And I must say, we were able to press on an open door in terms of the Clinton administration and things were brought to a happy conclusion but not before Sarajevo had been put through a terrible siege and Srebrenica had lost untold lives and humiliated uh, Dutch peacekeepers. But I, I, I dwell for a moment on those beginnings of the organization because what we came up with then and the formula that animates us to this day 20 years later is first an analysis that wakes people up which says uh, these conflicts just can't be allowed to run and run and run, which prompts action. And when we're at our best, we like to think we contribute to what that action is. We, we, we come up uh, with actual uh, recommendations. But my big proposition for this year's list and for the state of the world at this point at the beginning of 2016 really does go back to those roots of what we tried to do uh, to lift the siege of Sarajevo and find a negotiated solution to, to Bosnia and the, the breakup of the bigger Yugosla Yugoslavia, Kosovo, etc. Um, is you know, that we really see ourselves as an organization which tries to act when the world wants to walk by on the other side of the street. Uh, and I, I want to talk a bit about why that is, why is it that we're back to a place that reminds me of 20 years ago or before that reminds me of, of, of Cambodia? You know, what is it about today's world which makes it so inactive, even really on a crisis like Syria, which could not be more in our faces with the dramatic uh, flows of refugees? Uh, many of you, I suspect, in this ro room know Nick Gowing, the, the, the uh, BBC journalist, and he's been doing some work on, on um, what he calls Thinking the Unthinkable, a report for the Churchill Global Leaders Program. And uh, he talks in that about 2014 as the sort of what Carl Bildt called the great wake up year when unthinkables poured after unthinkables, when we had Putin seizing Crimea, we had the WHO failure uh, to see the Ebola crisis coming. Uh, we had Islamic State coming from nowhere to seize Mosul and declare a caliphate. Um, we saw the beginnings of the collapse of the oil price. And we saw the massive cyber attack on Sony, originating probably from North Korea. And you know, 2015 may not have been quite so cataclysmic in terms of unresponded to uh, unmet crises, but it was nevertheless the years of Europe's migration and refugee crisis and of you know, corporate scandals like the, the Volkswagen uh, emissions scandal. And you know, what Nick talks about in, in his draft report is of he, interviews he did with 60 leaders where they all basically confirmed a sense that whether you're in public or corporate leadership today, a sense of being overwhelmed by multiple intense pressures, by institutional conformity, by kind of groupthink and risk aversion. Uh, the fear for many people of career limiting moves if they are the whistleblowers when, when a crisis happens. And, you know, he, they, he Michael Ignatieff, the former leader of the Liberals in Canada and a professor at Harvard, um, you know, talks of his experience of seeing how um, the careerists and yes men are not warning their ministers, not doing their jobs, that the because the penalties for being the chicken little uh, of the, the crying that the sky is falling are so huge when it doesn't happen. Uh, and so our systems, he argues, uh, say keep calm, don't make a crisis. And you know, just one more quote from that of an anonymous former government official saying, we're stuck in a mindset which you think that even if we did think straight, we wouldn't have the capability to deal with it. Now, you know, I just want to suggest that, you know, that in a sense, this uh, appearance of leadership not being up to the task of the challenges of these different conflicts and the way they're running out of control is, is not, I think, because the people in charge of the Foreign Office or the UN or the UK government or its counterparts are somehow 
not the men or women of yesteryear. I think it's quite different. I think it's around the changed context in which policy is made. And I don't want to just make half a dozen quick points, which I think explain, uh, say a lot about the context of our selection of 10 conflicts this year. The first is the changing nature of conflict. It just simply isn't the old interstate conflict that you can easily get your, your hands around. Um, there are a lot fewer, if you like, um, you know, of, of the, those conflicts. Uh, there are a lot more civil wars, a lot more internal conflict. And what we're starting to see is, after years of decline, that the numbers of those killed in conflicts around the world are now sharply increasing with uh, 42 conflicts, 180,000 people killed in 2014, of which obviously Syria was by far the largest. That was its peak year of loss of life, with I think nearly 200,000 people uh, left. But you know, Syria is, in a sense, the extreme example with half that population of 22 million now either internally displaced uh, or, or in exile. But they are, you know, the very visible tip of a bigger iceberg with uh, 2015 being a year where for the first not time in a very long time since the Second World War, we're now above 60 million refugees in the world with a hugely larger number of uh, different categories of uh, migrant movements as, as well. But, you know, it's again, it's the nature of this conflict which is so challenging. Uh, and, you know, what we've seen over the last two years of the rise of what one might call the internationalized internal conflict. Uh, and indeed, you know, we've got the highest recorded incidence of such conflicts in any period since the Second World War. What do I mean by that? A conflict that's inside a country like Syria, but which draws in uh, fighters from a much broader geographic uh, spread, from a much wider pool. And the radicalization that's associated with that is increasingly hard, whether it's Syria, whether it's Boko Haram uh, in the Lake Chad Basin, increasingly hard for traditional policymakers to get their arms round. It's like oil, it slips through your hands. Uh, it's so hard to get at the roots of a conflict where part of them may lie in uh, failed integration policies in France or the UK, and another part lies in a violent, insidious conflict uh, in parts of Iraq and Syria uh, itself. But if that's part of it, conflicts we just can't get at the roots of so easily, the second is clearly the whole multipolarity of, of today's international system. You know, the very obvious rise of China, but not of China alone, of big regional forces in their different regions, the influence that Saudi Arabia and Iran are having over the Middle East and the proxy wars that they've generated in uh, places like Yemen, but more broadly through the region as well. Uh, the rise of a Brazil, uh, whatever its current economic difficulties in Latin America or of an India uh, in the South Asia region. And of course, against that, the relative uh, disempowerment and disenfranchisement in these regional conflicts of the old P5, the world's post-Second World War policemen, the much reduced influence that certainly a Britain and France have, uh, but even a United States has in the ability to bring these conflicts uh, to a successful uh, conclusion. And within that multipolarity, the reappearance, not of a new global power to challenge the US, but a glo once global power, now very forceful regional power, Russia. The third point that I think you know, creates the context for, 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 for our crises you know, is the tremendous prevalence of new non-state actors. ISIS is, is the one that will all come to mind, Boko Haram uh, is another. But they apply you know, 
military levels of, of, of violence and methods of, of, of actual execution, which horrify and catch headlines around the world. But they also now control territory. They run proto-economies, in the case of ISIS, uh, drawing heavily on, on, on oil revenue. And they can project violence, uh, as they have done in Paris and Istanbul. But now, you know, just in the last week, uh, the tragic incidents in, in Burkina Faso and uh, in Indonesia, just further examples of this, this sort of insidious internationalization uh, of these movements uh, reach. And you know, in it, the normal military response is in many ways stranded. Uh, where the recent history of actually engaging on the ground in Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya, you know, has, you know, in a sense, uh, defenestrated a generation of Western policymakers because of the failure of those interventions in large part, um, or the difficulties at least that they've encountered. Uh, it becomes even harder uh, when you're de dealing with these quicksilver movements which will prey on civilians, whether it's a Friday night in Paris or, 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 or wherever, the normal military sp response is even more, if you like, uh, marginalized. And hence to the uh, fourth point, if, if I may, which is the whole challenge of early warnings. Um, you know, there's, there's always, I, being an ex-UN guy, um, you know, there's a huge debate always at the UN about couldn't we do a better job of seeing conflicts before they come and, and reacting to them. Um, and I remember as a young UN intern just out of graduate school in um, um, the mid-1970s, uh, proudly occupying my desk as an intern on the 38th floor of the UN and a large dusty file being put on my desk and my boss saying, ah, some member states are again talking about the need for us to have an early warning system. Uh, could you just read through all these failed efforts to establish one and just write a note for the Under Secretary General um, on the impracticalities of it? And you know, some intern, I'm sure, is dusting off my note along with the rest of the file uh, to prepare a similar report now. And there is a certain madness about it because actually it's not that we have difficulty in predicting the crises. The real issue is we have difficulty in responding to them while they re remain incipient. Uh, we know from that list I gave you before that Burundi is rapidly going to hell in a handbasket and actually admirably the AU has tried to respond uh, in recent weeks by trying to grip it. But the fundamental issue is that while conflicts can be avoided, while we can walk by on the other side of the street, the international political system does. And that's what's needed is the political will to recognize that a conflict prevented is one where lives are saved and costs are much less uh, than waiting till it becomes uh, full blown, uh, full blown conflict. Um, and so, to, to um, my fifth point, if you like, on this, which is, you know, if it's difficult enough to respond to a Burundi as it was in its time to a Bosnia or whatever, it's even harder to generate the kind of strategic, long-term investment and level of response needed to head off the big elephants, the big black elephants that threaten the future. And uh, let me just take the refugee crisis in Europe is one such issue. While this last year, half the refugees who came were from Syria and another 20% from Afghanistan, the long-term issue for Europe is its demographic relationship to Africa. You know, a region which has got such rapid population growth that by the end of the century, 37% of the men and women uh, of working age, according to the UN demographers, will be from Africa, will be Africans. Uh, it is a dramatic transformation where the great majority of global population growth over the remainder of the cent uh, century will be in that continent. And the world faces one of its great strategic choices, as does the leadership and young men and women of that continent. Is it going to develop and build 
a productive political economy that can offer jobs and decent lives to that growing population? Or are they going to decant in desperation, fleeing conflict and poverty onto the shores of Europe? Now, there will be room for a lot of them in an aging Europe, which will need a renewed and younger workforce, but not for all of them. And in that sense, the self-interest that Europe has in successfully encouraging and supporting an African-led development effort over the coming decades is huge. But are we making that level of strategic commitment, or is it in its strange way a bit like climate change, um, that it's our children's problem? Uh, the difficulty of really mounting a cross-generational effort to preempt a very obvious problem coming our way is something that our political system has huge difficulty still uh, in, in responding to. And hence, to my last, if you like, con contextual point, the, this failure of leadership. As I said, I, I don't think it's that those of us in positions of government now or when I was in government some year, a few years ago, it's not, I think, that we were lesser men and women than those who came before us or that today's are lesser men and women than we were. Uh, but it is that we're seeing a collapse of the different levels of government and institution which are critical for managing global problems, short-term security problems, long-term problems of the kind I've just mentioned. You see it first at the international level, a utterly dysfunctional UN Security Council. You know, after the post-1989 honeymoon where we started to get really useful, important consensus in the council, it has now it lapsed into a high level of dysfunctional gridlock. Uh, again, reflecting the dysfunction of broader global politics, of the re-emergence of Russia, the rise of China, uh, the reducing influence of, 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 of the Western powers in the council, and the frustration of many other countries that they are not represented on the council in the way that they think fit and proper for their new condition of, of, of power. And so the failures are legion, Yemen. Um, we see, you know, on that list, there are many of them, South Sudan, uh, where the council has just not acted. Now, it's finally in December got a resolution on Syria, uh, but whether or not that translates into a really sustained effort to build the peace there, uh, we don't know yet. But in a sense, that failure of the council, you know, is only, if you like, indicative, a symptom of a broader failure of, 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 of governance. And here, you know, I think uh, we've seen both a group of Western leaders, in a sense, living under the shadow of the failures of their immediate predecessors from Iraq onwards. Uh, we see, uh, you know, in a sense, great caution, and it's been very evident in the presidency of, of, of Barack Obama. But we now see the reaction to that not being a considered foreign policy so much as you know, an angry populism. So the good news is foreign policy is more a subject in this current American presidential debate than it's been in years. Uh, the bad news is it's of a highly populist character, uh, you know, where uh, claims like building a wall along the Mexican border to keep Mexicans out uh, are sustainable even at a time when there is a net migration of Mexicans back to Mexico, uh, rather that which exceeds the number coming in. So the wall would have presumably the entirely opposite effect to what Mr. Trump uh, I I imagines. It would stop people going home. Um, but you know, the, the, the South China Sea and the conflict there between a resurgent China, which you know has still not learned to live with its neighbors in an effective, respectable way, respectful way, and the. Uh, attempted re-engagement of the US to project power uh, into the Pacific, uh, you know, is in a sense a new uh, flashpoint with a similar sort of shift of forces going on in, in the Middle East as well. And behind it, Western governments struggling with the rise of, in a sense, their own fragmentation of domestic politics, of the difficulty of really sustaining the kind of leadership which allows them to project uh, an effective uh, foreign policy. So, you know, a closing word, because a UN Secretary General doesn't by any way, um, you know, overcome 
the much more fundamental crisis of governance, which I think has got a lot to do with technology and social and economic change and a lot of other things at the national uh, level and subnational level. But obviously, you know, I am, you know, a very much a generation Kofi Annan UN official who remember when there was a Secretary General who uh, was not shy of using Article 99 and operating under his own good offices, was not shy of using the bully pulpit of his job to uh, raise issues in, 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 in front of the global community and over the heads of, of political leaders. And this is a year uh, where that's up. And I think, you know, one issue many of us will watch with great attention is whether the P5 uh, will have the imagination uh, to recognize the mistakes they made by uh, appointing a lesser Secretary General this last time round, not lesser as an individual, but lesser in terms of the political space and leadership uh, they allowed him uh, than, than Kofi Annan. And, you know, I think here, just as a closing point, as we are meeting here in London, I think, you know, the UK has a real role to play. If it is to demonstrate to the world that there is a case for a membership of the P5 um, uh, for a country like the UK, which it no longer gets from its sort of batting average or its, its um, you know, global power, um, if there is a case for Britain and France retaining those memberships, it's because they are willing to act on behalf of the greater UN and not just tamely follow uh, the US, uh, Russia and China into the voting lobby. So their ability to stand up for a first class Secretary General, likely to be a woman, uh, to be chosen at the end of this year to force a more transparent and open process, you know, is an important indication of whether, you know, both countries can really, in a sense, use the historical privilege of being in that council still to take an important step towards at least renewing the international level of governance. It doesn't, as I say, address the much more fundamental issues of domestic and national government, but, you know, as we always say in the crisis group, as we often present incremental solutions to things, you've got to start somewhere. Thank you very much. <laughs>